everyone's talking about Josh Brolin and Thanos, but did you know when he premiered in comics? It was in Iron Man number 55 in February 1973. Now you do. Yo, 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 how's it going, comic book reading universe? It is I, your friendly neighborhood comic book reviewer, Steven Savelli, once again representing hashtag nerd swag, and I am here today to bring to you the staple stash for comics that came out on Wednesday. Um, I have nine comics to review this week. I have one from DC, four from Marvel, and four from Image Comics. Imagine that. That's pretty cool. Um, just for you guys' benefit down below, I've created timestamps so you can click ahead to hear about comics that you want to hear about. And up here is a little link that'll have you, or a little icon. If you click on that, you'll subscribe to the channel. And down here is some links to our Facebook and our Twitter pages. So, yeah. Um, let's get some discussion going. Uh, for the first comic I'm going to review today, it is Batman Eternal number eight. Now, once again, the story and uh, the story of this is by Scott Snyder and James Tynion the fourth. The script on this specific issue is by John Layman and Ray Fox and Tim Seeley are contributing writers, and Gillam March is on the art. Um, so it's a huge team for this one issue, but we know that Scott Snyder and James Tynion are. Um, they they plotted the whole story, um, and it's a group of writers. So each time we read a Batman Eternal, it's usually somebody different. Um, but this issue we got John Layman, so that's cool, and we got Gillum March, and I think this is the first time that he has done art on the Batman Eternal run. Um, we're in issue eight already, which means we're two months in because these are coming out weekly. So it's the eighth week in a row we've gotten Batman Eternal. All right, I've had some t huge gripes lately that we haven't been talking about Jim Gordon being in jail. And um, last issue, I was kind of happy because we got back to close to the original plot line. And this issue specific is all about the Gotham Police Department, Jim Gordon, and Jason Bard. So that's really exciting. From page one to really the end of this book, we have constant action from Batman, um, and we have tons of dialogue between... Um, the commissioner, Jason Bard, and Batman messing with street thugs, really trying to figure out what is going on. Um, by the end of this, the commissioner, the new commissioner, uh, who's in Carmine Falcone's pocket, um, puts up the bat signal, gets Batman to show up. Batman knows he's heading into a trap because he knows that the police department's not working with him at this point um, because he had tied up some fools and they didn't arrest him. Uh, he finds out from Alfred that they were just let free and they were never booked. So Batman shows up at the bat signal. The commissioner wants to arrest Batman. Jason Bard it really helps Batman by um, making the, um, one of the divisions shoot off these smoke grenades. Um, and that allows Batman to get out of this little predicament. Um, there's one panel where Jason Bard has his gun right to Batman's face. And then he pulls it back and smiles. And Batman um, dips and takes off. Um, so it's really cool that we get our first interaction with Bruce Wayne and Jason Bard. Really figuring out that they're in this together. At least to the best of his knowledge. Um, we see Stephanie Brown finally uh, in this comic. She's been out of this for a few weeks we know she's going to end up helping Batman again. If you guys know who Stephanie Brown is, you could look her up. She's going to be um, one of his sidekicks uh, and has been before in the past. So um, we finally get her in this issue, but it's only for a few pages. And it's kind of just like an update like, hey, we didn't forget about this girl. Um, other than that, there's just some great, great character building with uh, Jason Bard and Batman figuring out that the police department is after um, him for sure and the commissioner is against him um, Carmine Falcone obviously came back from being gone for I believe five years five plus years and Batman finds out he was in Hong Kong um, during that time and he built up a huge uh, gang mafia there and so Batman at the end of his comics like you know what if I can't figure out what's going on with Carmine Falcone in the present 
then I'm gonna go figure out what happened in his past. So he ventures off to Hong Kong and the big cliffhanger of this, I'm gonna give it away, so spoiler alert. Um, the big cliffhanger of this, it's not a big cliffhanger, whoop de freaking do is when he flies into Hong Kong, Catwoman is repelling from a building in Hong Kong is like, oh no, Batman's here. That's gonna make things difficult. Uh, you know, it's whatever, it was cool. Um, I've been down on this book uh, for a few issues, but now with seven, I liked. And with eight, I kind of liked it a lot. Um, it's very surprising. I'm going to give the writing on this an eight out of ten. And I'm going to give the art on this a seven out of ten. Um, I really like the art, but there's a few places where Batman looks, um, let's say, interesting. There's a, few, there's a few panels where he looks very powerful, and then a few panels where he looks a little off, but... Um, overall, I really liked Batman Eternal never, number eight, and, uh, I'm starting to get back on the bandwagon. Uh, there was a three issue span there between like issue four, five, and six that I just kind of hated. Um, and now we're getting back on track. So good stuff. All right. That's it for DC. So next I'm going to go into Marvel comics. And the first issue I'm going to review is Guardians of the Galaxy number 15. Um, this cover is very misleading. It says, and now Captain Marvel. At the end of last issue, she kind of made a appearance, and she's not in this entire book. Um, I'm a little disappointed about that. Uh, I was really looking forward to it. Now, Guardians of the Galaxy have been in Captain Marvel books, um, and I thought she was going to be now a recurring character in the Guardians books. I'm assuming she is, but she's not in this book where it says, and now Captain Marvel. I mean, how misleading could you possibly be? That doesn't make any sense. She's not in this. Um, you could, I would be happier if you even put her on the cover and just didn't put this and now Captain Marvel in the, in the corner. I mean, she's not in there. So how can you say and now? Anyway, that's my only gripe because I love this issue. Um, this is write, writing by Brian Michael Bendis with pencils by Nick Bradshaw and Cameron Stewart. Um, Last issue ended with all the Guardians being captured by different races. So this just goes through it. every like two or three pages. We go to a different Guardian and find out who they're captured by and where they're at. So we start off with Rocket Raccoon. He's being experimented on by the Kree. And they're trying to figure out like the origin of his species because no one's ever seen another rocket like him. Um, and he wakes up in the middle of surgery because the anesthesia, the anesthesia didn't work on him it it should have lasted but since there isn't a species like his they didn't they figured it would work the amount that they gave him he wakes up in the middle of it and it gets really creepy when the supreme intelligence of the kree says keep operating on him when he's awake um super creepy uh so he goes through a bunch of pain there um we have gamora who's captured by the badoon and it and it's so on and so on um venom thinks that the Avengers from Earth are here to save him when really they're just the scrolls um, impersonating the Avengers. Uh, last issue, uh, we had Star Lord Peter Quill um, talking to the King of Spartax, Jason, who's his father, and he, his father's trying to convince him that he should quit being a guardian and he needs to join the Empire, join his lineage, and rule. Um, the galaxy and he said no um, and when he said no all of his partners got captured at the end of this comic Peter Quill makes a decision that you know what to save the lives of all my brothers and sisters um, in the guardians of the galaxy you know what fine I'll work with you dad just go free the guardians and Peter Quill finds out that it may be a little too late because they're already captured um, so he makes a uh, you know, a punk choice at the end, like Peter Quill always does, and he runs away, and, and we assume is trying to get free. Um, I'm going to give the writing on Guardians of the Galaxy a 8.5 out of 10, um, minus the cover. <laughs> the cover really frustrated me, um, and I'll give the art on this book a 6 out of 10. I, I actually really didn't care for this at all. We have it, I don't believe we've seen this artist on this book, and I just didn't really care for the art. It's It's very childish and cartoony um and i don't know i just really wasn't digging it but overall not too bad of a read all right next up we have avengers 
not Avengers, Avengers, number 30. Um, this is written by Jonathan Hickman with art by Lionel Francis Yu. Now, this left off last issue with Captain America and Iron Man fighting, like literally fighting, um, because Captain America remembered that the Illuminati wiped his memory away. As soon as he finds out that he knows the Illuminati wiped his memory away, he goes right after Tony Stark because he knows Tony Stark is the orchestrator of the Illuminati. Um, they get into a big fight. And right at the end of the fight, the time gem appears in Captain America's hand, and all of a sudden, whoop, they disappear. And that's how the last issue ended. So this issue picks up with them whoop, <laughs> reappearing um, 50 years in the future. Um, they continue to fight, and of course, you get arrows and guns pointed at you like you knew it was going to happen and it's the avengers 50 years in the future they're led it seems to be that they're led by hawkeye 50 years from now and let me tell you old hawkeye is a bad dude he like not a bad guy but he's just a bad dude he's he's a grumpy he's stubborn he's strong he's smart and he's fierce man i i really liked hawkeye from the future he was cool he gets in a little arrow fight with uh hawkeye from the present and uh hawkeye from the present's like yep that's definitely me in the future uh i don't know anyone who shoots as good as i do with an arrow hawkeye confronts the avengers because he remembers traveling to the future too right because it's the time continuum he he waited for the Avengers to show up because he remembers showing up as an Avenger when he was younger and it, it's a whole circle of life, right? But it turns out that the Avengers now showed up a week earlier than they were supposed to. And Hawkeye gives a warning to the Avengers, like, I'm supposed to tell you guys two things. He tells um, he tells the Avengers that they're gonna travel in time multiple times more into the future, into the future, into the future. And then he tells Captain America a secret that we as readers don't even know what he told them. And then he tells Tony Stark that he needs to go back in time right now, use his Infinity Gym, go back in time and try to save the Earth. Because if he doesn't now, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Um, and then a few other things unravel in this book, but it is an Original Sin tie-in. Um, it's not really a tie-in because of the Original Sin run. It's more of a tie-in because Jonathan Hickman is exploring this the Original Sin of... Tony Stark and the Illuminati wiping Captain America's mind or brain. Um, it's not really the original Sin story, if that makes sense. Um, it is this Avengers comics original Sin. Um, that's how I think they're going to play all of these. So anyway, I'm going to give the writing on Avengers 30 an 8 out of 10. And I'm going to give the art a 9 out of 10. There were multiple splash pages that were just... Um, beautifully detailed and laid out and i really really enjoyed that issue so that's it for that one all right and next up we have thanos annual this is obviously issue number one um this is written by jim starlin um penciler by ron Lim. now jim starlin is the one who uh invented thanos so obviously he knows how to write the guy um and this is all leading up to thanos the infinity the infinity revelation um, and what that's going to be is it's not going to be a like weekly or bi-weekly or monthly comic. It's just going to be an original graphic novel. Um, if you guys don't know what Marvel's been doing is they, they've been putting this out. Um, these things called OGNs, original graphic novels. They just released an X-Men an X-Men one called No More Humans, which I'm going to review on this channel. Um, I think it's like 90 to 120 pages, something like that. Uh, but they're going to, uh, Jim Starlin's going to write the uh, Thanos uh Thanos, Thanos, however you want to say it. I like Thanos personally, so I'm going to stick with that. The Thanos Infinity Revelation, um, I think this this fall or winter. So what this book does is it jumps on uh, right after Marvel, um, classic Captain Marvel number 33 from 1974. So this picks up um, in the not 1974 in the comic, but 1974 in our real time, back when this was written um, 40 plus years ago. Um, well, it's, it's like, yeah, 40 years ago. Um, exactly. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, picking up from that story. It's kind of just a gap in time that Jim Starlin's going to fill in. And he's not really filling it in because um, this whole, it's, it's a one-shot annual. Everything we learn in here kind of gets erased and set back. Um, 
to the beginning of this story. It was more of just an exploration for people that don't know about Thanos. Um, they run through the multiple Thanos stories, the Infinity Gauntlet, um, and, and stuff like that, and two of his other stories. And it just gives a little background on him and a lot of the big comic runs he's been in. Um, that's really what this book is for. It's, I think it's definitely informative for people that don't know too much about Thanos. If you don't know too much about him and you do want to learn a little bit about some big events that he's been involved in, this is kind of like a big recap before Revelation, the graphic novel, comes out at the end of this year. Um, don't have too much to say except that this is awesome. The art in here is classic Jim Starlin, like 1970s, 1980s art. Um, and the writing is superb. He he hasn't lost it at all. And I, I really like that this reads just like the Infinity Gauntlet reads. Um, or this reads just like all of how Thanos was written back then. Um, Jason Aaron's Thanos, which came out um, last year or the beginning of, yeah, I think it ended last year. It was a lot darker. And this Thanos by Jim Starlin, the guy that, that created him, is a little lighter, a little more jokey, and totally full of himself and and. I really like Jason Aaron's Thanos better just because I like darker stuff more. Um, but this one was super cool and I really appreciated it. So it's a good book. I'm going to give the writing on um, Thanos Annual a 8 out of 10. And I'm going to give the art a 9.5 out of 10. I'm, I'm, I could be convinced to give it a 10 out of 10. I just love the classic old comic book art style. Um, I have a bunch on my, on my wall back here of... of Thor, the God of Thunder, and um, I just really like how old comic books look, so that was very appealing to me. All right, next up, we have Uncanny Avengers number 20. Um, this has been dealing with a lot of time traveling. Um, <laughs> all of, almost all of Marvel's comics have to do with time traveling, um, which I think is going to end up leading to a huge event that will reset all the time because there's there's too much jumping i we talked about avengers earlier which is jumping in time uncanny avengers is jumping in time x-men is jumping in time um guardians of the galaxy isn't but a, a, just a lot of books are so this picks up with um us way in the future i've been reviewing every issue of this book this is avenge the earth part three written by rick reminder and art by daniel Kuna, the same team that's been on it um we're basically on a planet x where mutants have been raptured now they have their own planet um humans are now the minority and we have havoc and wasp and a few other um people like beast who is a mutant um trying to find a way back to back in time to save the earth from being destroyed and to stop the rapture of the mutants from happening um, so we have the X Council, which is like the future X Men and X Force, fighting Havoc and his team of renegades. So we have Kang the Conqueror, we have Strife, we have Doctor Doom, um, and we have a few other characters helping uh, Havoc. And we have we have Thor the Avenger, who's in time with them. And this is just a the whole first half is just battle, 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 battle. We have Sunfire, he's um, fighting Banshee. Um, we have Wolverine finally coming back uh because he's been set in this little torture chamber <laughs> so he's finally coming out um and kicking his son dakin's ass who's really just an archangel right now and working for apocalypse um <laughs> wasp calls uh i believe it's wasp let me see um somebody i don't remember who it is in here i'd have to i'd have to read it over again but somebody calls dakin who's now an like an arc or is now a um Horseman of Apocalypse, not Archangel. I, I misspoke. Um, calls him a blueberry wolverine, which is just funny because that's exactly what he looks like. He's purple. He's dark purple and dark blue. Uh, and he looks like Wolverine. Obviously, he's Dakin. And, uh, and it's just pretty funny. Um, this ends with the Uncanny Avengers or Havoc um, and Thor and Wasp being sent back in time by Kang. So what they've been trying to do the last three issues of going back in time and saving the world um, they get, and at, it ends with Kang sending them back. Well, we can assume Kang sent them back. We actually don't see them arrive back in time. So this is a pretty solid read. I'd give this book, um, this is once again another great book. I'm giving it a 9 out of 10, and I'm giving The Art by Daniel Okuna an 8.5 out of 10. Uh, I haven't liked a few issues ago, I was really dogging his art, but it's grown on me a lot, and I, I really like it, and the panel layouts are very original, and... 
I can dig it. All right, that's it for Marvel. Now we're going to move on to Image Comics. We got four of these. Um, the first issue we're going to review is Southern Bastards, number two. This is written by Jason R. Jason R. Jason Aaron with art by Jason Latour. Um, now what's great about this comic from Image is it's not a superhero comic. And it's nice when I'm reading all these superhero comics and time traveling and, and um, convoluted stories like Batman Eternal to just have a story. It's almost like a movie, um, this this book or a TV show. Um, so it's a nice break um, for me to read this. And not only that is Jason Aaron's my favorite comic book writer out right now. Um, and Jason Latour, who, who's now working on Wolverine and the X-Men, is a great artist. So we have Earl here from issue number one. In issue number one, Earl, this old gentleman from Alabama, this, this place called Craw County, he comes back to his hometown because he moved to Birmingham. He comes back to his hometown because his dad, who was the sheriff of the town, died. He's coming back to pack up his stuff and deal with family matters, um, get his father, um, do the funeral and all that business. And when he gets in town, he finds out that there's some shady stuff happening. Um, and he can't help himself but to try to help. So this issue, it starts with him packing up his his father's stuff, and he's ready to leave town. Um, and when he leaves town, he's like, you know what? I'm basically going to decide that I'm going to... It's getting late, so he decides that he's going to go to the high school football game. He shows up at the high school football game, and he sees the guy that he knows is causing all the trouble. Coach Boss. Um, he, he is... Just an old grumpy dude that um, that just doesn't look like he would be in charge of like this gang war kind of a thing. But he looks like this old southern white guy who's probably like 60 or 70 easily. He's, he's coach boss. Um, he coaches the, the high school football team. Now, last issue, we saw Coach Boss's name on everything. The barbecue, the convenience store, um, the liquor store, the bar, the everything. Everything has Coach Boss's name on it. And the guy that, that Earl helped in issue one stumbles onto the field, bloody, while the game's going on, asking for Boss to accept his apology and to help him. Um, Boss says, get him the hell off my field. Why is he here? I don't know this guy. And, of course, Earl runs down on the field and is like, you don't know who this is. Um, you hurt this guy. I know you did it. Like, I'm going to deal with this. And he, he walks away and he goes to the sheriff's office. Um, finds out that the cop played high school football for Coach Boss. And we might we might have some cops working with some gangs here in Crowd County. And he just walks out on the cop in the middle of talking. and Because uh, he knows he's not going to get any help. Um, and towards the end, he heads back home, and something miraculous happens where he finds, he basically gets a wooden club just like his dad used when he was younger to fight off criminals. Um, he stumbles upon, he doesn't stumble upon, a miraculous event happens where he gets a wooden club just like his father's, and it's really his dad saying to him, like, you need to save and protect this town. Um, that's what happens in Southern Bastards, issue number two, um, I mean, other stuff happens, but I don't want to give away all the spoilers. I, I talked a little more about specific things that happen in this book because I highly, highly recommend Southern Bastards. It is a mature comic, so if you're a young teenager, um, you really shouldn't be reading this. And if you are a parent that has a kid, I wouldn't let them read it, or a younger brother. I would think you should probably be 15 to 16 plus to read this. It's mature, so you, you're supposed to be like 17, 18, but... Um, 15, 16, I think you're good to read Southern Bastards. There's just a lot of, well, there's drugs and there's a lot of cursing in this book. So anyway, I highly recommend Southern Bastards by Jason Aaron. Really good read. And Jason Latour does an awesome job. Um, this, this, um, book only ha uses about like six colors. Um, it's pretty cool. They're all real. They're basically wine colors, um, with a little bit of hints of blue and purple in here. So highly recommended book from Image. All right, next up from Image, we have Cowl, number one. Now, this is a superhero book from, from Image, and what this is is Cowl stands for the Chicago Organized Workers League. This is set in the 1960s of Chicago, and it's really about a league of superheroes that 
well, they're a union. They're unionized workforce, excuse me, in Chicago. They have a deal with the city where they, they work for them, just like a police department or fire department. So they are their own division in the city. They have like a, a tactical team. They have a detective team. Um, they have uh, a few other teams. They don't, they have a recon team. Um, and this book starts with you just being thrown into 1962 in the north side of Chicago with a chase for a supervillain called Skylancer. So we have these heroes who we don't even know their name, and they're chasing this guy who we, we don't even know his name, <laughs> but we know that who the good guy is, who the good guys are, and who the bad guy is. Um, and this book kind of moves really, really quickly. Um, there's no introduction of who's who and who's what and what the Chicago Organized Workers League is. It just jumps you right in. I actually really like that. I like that there wasn't a slow story buildup. It just, boom, right in action for really the first half of this book. So the middle part of this book is a little bit of recon and detective work. And the end part of this book is more action and a awesome cliffhanger. Um, the art on this book. So this is written by Kyle Higgins with art, or Kyle Higgins and Alex Siegel with art by Rod Reese. Now the art in this book um, is just fantastic. It definitely looks like watercolors for sure. And every page is stunning. The The splash pages is are done very well. The um, action scenes are very fluid and are super cool to look at. And um, even the detective scenes, there's just good imagery used, like cool zoom-ins, cool detail lens, um, cool detail lenses, um, zooming in on details of the scene. And overall, just a really stunning comic. Now, when I heard about this cow book, it blew my mind, the idea of this comic, um, that there's a union of workers, uh, or union of superheroes working for a town like, or a city like Chicago. It is very reminiscent of Watchmen. That's the closest thing that I can say that this is like. Um, and that's putting in some high praise. Because um, not just the idea. It's similar to Watchmen where the government has a piece. The government and, and state and city governments have a piece of it. But also the art style and the time. So this is set in the 60s. And the art is also kind of similar to Watchmen. It's Watchmen-esque. Um, very dirty, gritty, and <laughs> strictly badass. I, I highly recommend Cal. I'm going to give the writing on this book a 9.5 out of 10. Um, and I'm going to give the art on this book a 10 out of 10. I'm giving, I'm giving really high reviews this week, but this will be my recommend of the week is Cowl number one. I didn't want to turn the page. Um, and that's not because the story was moving slow. It was because the art was so good on this comic book. Um, every panel I just felt was fantastic. And uh, I just, I loved Cowl. This is definitely a book I'm going to keep reading for sure. Image is really stepping it up lately to me. Um, for a guy that two years ago never read any Image comics besides like a Walking Dead comic. Um, as you can see, almost half of my poll this week was Image Comics. Um, they're crapping on DC for sure. And they're starting to gain on Marvel with um, the amount of like high quality comics. They also have comics that are bad, just like every publisher does. Um, but I would say support Cowl um, by Kyle Higgins and Alex Siegel. These are creator owned books. Um, all of basically all issues published by Image are, are creator owned and, and they just publish it for them. But um, so Cow number one, this is also a mature comic. If you are a young teenager or you have kids that are young, um, I would not suggest this book to them. Once again, 15, 16 plus for sure. Um, if you wanted a book to that is about superheroes, because um, some image, some image books are not. If you want a book about superheroes that is not Marvel or DC, at this point, this is my number one recommend. Um, fantastic, fantastic work here by Kyle Higgins and Alex Siegel. And I feel like I'm going to be speaking about Rod Reese um, a lot of maybe my favorite artist out right now. Um, we could put him up with Asad Ribic, who does <laughs> God, uh, Thor God of Thunder. So great book. 
All right, next up we have Trees, number one from Image Comics, and that's written by Warren Ellis and art by Jason Howard. Warren Ellis is a guy that's writing Moon Knight for Marvel right now, and every issue of that has been fantastic. So when I found out he was releasing a creator-owned book on Image, I knew I had to read it. I knew I had to get it. So I don't have this in my hands because I read it digitally, but what is Trees? Um, Trees is we start 10 years after the invasion of aliens. Um, and the reason why it's called Trees is because basically out of nowhere one day, these giant columns shot down from space, like huge columns, like the size of, 10 city blocks these giant columns just shot down from the sky and jetted into the earth all over the earth um they just shot down and basically if you're if you're standing in any any city you just see this giant circle column that goes up as far as the eye can see into the clouds um and these columns um called trees have like it looks like what what is roots growing um and there's like this poison toxic stuff that that spills out of the roots and the in the trees um kind of like a toxic sap um really weird i i i don't know what's going on and and in this book they don't reveal any answers um what they do is they they show us 10 years after um where civilizations are not doing so good um and everywhere around these trees have now become slums in these major cities because no one wants to live by them because they're toxic. Um, so we have, we have people building cities on top of these root structures. Um, and they're alien and no one knows what they're there for, or no one's even seen any of the aliens. They just saw these, all these columns just appeared and now they just live their life because they're used to them being there. Um, so I'm assuming maybe, (laughs) This story is going to be about how the aliens now finally show up. I'm assuming to get resources. Um, But yeah, we don't know yet. So we follow, I think, three people around in different parts of the world and see how they're dealing with these trees that are in the city. Um, And we don't get too much, really, except for an introduction of these three characters. Um, I don't have too much to say about that or other than that, except that. The writing was super sweet by Warren Ellis, and the art by Jason Howard was pretty damn cool. I really liked the idea of this book. Um, One of the reasons why I like it a lot is because I don't know what's happening. And sometimes that's a bad thing when the story is convoluted. Um, But for this, it's a good thing because it feels very structured, and I feel like Warren Ellis knows what he's doing. So I'm excited to read issue number two coming up in the future, near future. I'm going to give the writing on trees, number one, an eight out of ten. I'm going to give the art a 7 out of 10. The art didn't astound me. Um, it was just okay. Um, and and thinking about it now, compared to other books that I've reviewed this week, I should probably give the writing a 7 out of 10 on trees and the art a 6 out of 10. Um, I kind of score these independently, but I feel like compared to other books, um, this wasn't as great. But I still highly recommend trees. Um, at this point, it's another book from Image that's not about superheroes. All right, and last up, I have Deadly Class, number five. Now, this is a, another sweet cover. These are these covers are have been so awesome. This is written by Rick Remender with art by Wes Craig. Now, Rick Remender is the guy that wrote um, Uncanny Avengers, number 20. And uh, it's nice to have him writing this Deadly Class um, because it's not about superheroes again. We have another um, creator-owned book from Image. Not about superheroes. Now, where this picks off is um, Marcus is in <laughs> uh, is in Las Vegas, and he's tripping out on acid. Um, so right there tells you this is a mature comic. So apparently, um, all these writers that write, like Warren Ellis, Rick Remender, Jason Aaron, um, Kyle Higgins, and Eric Siegel, like all these artists that write for DC and, and Marvel, um, they have to play by the by the kid rules where they have to write for all ages um they go to image and write adult comics so here's rick reminder's version of that deadly class um marcus who is the main protagonist of this story um is in vegas right now in issue number five and he's tripping on acid he doesn't know what's real he doesn't know what's fake he walks he goes into the casino and mr t like comes out of one of the casinos and is like i pity a fool that doesn't play my slot machine and uh, he's just tripping balls and he does 
he doesn't know what's real or fake. Now he's there, and why this is called Deadly Class is he's in an, he's in an assassin school, and he's there with some friends because they're here in Vegas to kill one of his buddies fathers because he was a terrible parent and he deserves to die so they decide to go kill his buddy's dad while he's tripping on acid and marcus ends up killing the guy's dad even though marcus wasn't supposed to but in the middle of it going down the guy wussed out um so marcus picked up picks up a lamp and knocks the guy right in the temple with the lamp the guy drops to the ground done dead and the buddy's like why'd you kill my dad why'd you kill my dad and kind of wants to back out of it um but then says thank you for doing it i'm a big wuss thank you thank you um and then marcus goes into more of a trip out and the girl that's been crushing on him pulls him into the room to get down and dirty with him and her boyfriend shows up tries to kill marcus marcus escapes um starts running away they get into a fight they're they're fighting with knives and uh, Marcus gets thrown through a glass window at a convenience store. He picks up a piece of glass, stabs the guy, or he doesn't stab him. He slashes the guy right across his chest. The guy's like, ha, 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 the boyfriend here, the angry boyfriend, um, punches Marcus, knocks him to the ground, and really starts curb stomping him uh, on the ground. And it ends with the last panel fading to black, um, basically hinting to us that Marcus dies. There's no way Marcus is going to die. This is issue number five, and he's the main protagonist. And we haven't even really gotten involved with any of the school stuff yet. But um, really solid read. Um, giving uh, Deadly Class a 8.75 out of 10, just to differentiate from some of these other ones. And I'm going to give the R on this a 9.5 out of 10. I, a lot of weeks, there's really bad comics, and I kind of... Ugh, it hurts reading through all of them, but this week, I'm telling you, almost basically every book I read was great. The experience was awesome, and what a fantastic week at comic books. This may be my favorite week yet of um, the plethora of books I got, the superhero, the non-superhero, um, even Batman Eternal was good. We have uh, Southern Bastards about like Southern football and barbecues. That was good. We had Deadly Class where we have an assassin uh, school and Vegas acid trip out. We have the Uncanny Avengers who are going through time. We have Guardians of the Galaxy where they're all captured. It's just an awesome week of comic books. That's all I can say. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's all I have for, for this week. Um, what can I say next? Uh, if you have any comments about anything I said, whether I'm right, wrong, stupid, or indifferent, Leave some comments down below. I would really love to talk to you guys. The whole reason I do this is not for me. This is for you to hopefully I'm giving enough good feedback on these books that I can um, sway you into buying or not buying books. And uh, I'm really doing this as recommendations for you guys so I can try to help pick out yeah, what you should and shouldn't read. Um, if you have any suggestions for me for books that I didn't read this week or books that I haven't read that you think I should start reading, leave those also down in the comment section below. Um, I am very open to read really any kind of comic book. If you say you need to read Dexter's Laboratory, I will try it out. But um, I want to I want to I want to review what my followers are reading. So if you're reading something I'm not reviewing, comment it down below and I'll try to I'll try to pick it up for sure. Um, other than that, um, like I said, you can click up on this little button to subscribe to the channel. Down here is some links to our Facebook and our Twitter pages. Um, and that's it for this week, guys. Um, I really appreciate you guys watching, and I will see you again. <laughs>